Hi, welcome back. Today we want to finish our cryptography, cryptography discussion and uh, end uh, the module three uh, so that we can begin our discussion on network security and web security. Um, and there's a lot of interesting topics we'll cover today. Just a little bit of recap. Uh, last time we talked about uh, DP Hellman key exchange, why it is broken, how to fix it, uh, RSA public key crypto system, which included the encryption scheme and also the digital signature scheme. Uh, we show why it is correct um, and you can use it to sign, but then you have to sign on hash uh, value of the messages, not the messages directly. Um, we also begin our discussion on the cryptographic hash function. So today we want to um, just a little bit of recap on what happened at RSA uh, because part of this is also to help you with your written homework assignment. Make sure that you submit on time, you start early. And also very, very, very importantly, if you don't type your assignment, your answers, if you choose to write it down, um, handwriting, make sure in, you write it clearly. If, if we cannot read it, um, then it has to be rejected. And so just make sure that um, use your best handwriting. If you know that your handwriting is horrible, just, you know, type it, uh, you know, uh, start early. Um, I say it's very important that you set up the, the right key. Uh, you, you pick two large primes and then you compute this totion function, you compute N, which is a product, and then you choose this uh, E, which is uh, has to be relatively prime with Z. Um, and then the, the secret sauce is really the secret key D, uh, where E times D um, mod Z equals to one. And so this is a very special private key and you have to keep it secret. You erase P and Q because otherwise that um, uh, people will be able to, there are ways to compute D based on the factors of N because N is public. Um, and so uh, if N is, people can find out the factors P and Q, then D is compromised. So the hardness is the uh, assumption is that you cannot easily find out the, the factors of a very large number. Encryption, you just raise a message to the power of E mod N and decryption is uh, raise the ciphertext to the power of D mod N. And then you can verify that it goes back to the same uh, message. Um, and the, in order to show it is correct, uh, we use a, a very important existing number theory result. Um, because the way that the E and D are chosen, it's exactly uh, come back to one when you do the, the decryption operation and you retrieve the original message. Very, very smart, very smart way of doing the encryption um, and decryption. So, so all of this is because you set it up in a way that you can um, retrieve the, the message. Um, you use the encryption algorithm in reverse for signing and verification. And, and signing is for message integrity. You make sure message is not tampered with. Um, and similar as the encryption scheme, you have the private key and the public key chosen at the beginning of the time. And of course, this is the signer, the signer who does that. And then the public key is revealed to everyone. Um, the signer will create a digital signature using the private key by raising the message to the power of D. Um, and the verifier will do the similar thing to uh, raise the, when, when, they, when they have to verify whether this signature corresponds to this message, right? Because you want to see, you receive this statement with this signature, is this statement being modified. And so you, you uh, raise the signature through the power of uh, um, E, and then that will give you back uh, an, a, a statement M prime. And if M prime matches the, the, the statement shown on this message, then everything is intact. And of course, very, very important to use a public key, the right public key. Otherwise, 
this doesn't, you know, you could use the wrong key, um, the attacker's key, then uh, you may be verifying attacker's signature as opposed to the, the intended signature. And we show that that naive RSA signature scheme is broken because that the signatures have this um, correlations with the original message. And so you can manipulate signatures, the, which is completely public, to create some new signature corresponding to a message that the signer has never signed on. And so, so we want to disrupt this multiplicative property, this correlation between signature and, and the original message. And, uh, and so, so here's some example of why this is bad. You, you don't sign directly on the message, you sign on the hash values. Um, so, so today we want to continue this discussion on cryptographic hash. Um, last time we said that it has several properties. One is easy to compute. It's, and it's one way um, you can compute a hash. Anyone can compute the hash of something, but then once they only have the hash, they cannot guess the pre-image, the original input. Um, it's also collision resistance. Ideally, we want them to have very, very low collisions. It's very hard to find two messages that give you the same hash. Um, to different messages. Another form we said that is, you know, arbitrarily find a collision. This is a harder, you know, you say, hey, I have this uh, uh, phone number. Can you find another, a different phone number that produce the same hash value? That, that's usually harder. Um, it's harder than just to give me any two messages that produce the same hash value. So all the MD5 and SHA-1, the, the, at least the initial demonstration of, of attack are following the first definition of collision resistance. Um, and so one way this, so we're, we'll talk about this a little bit more, um, is that you cannot get back to the original hash. And, and similarly, if you, you, you can infinitely compute the hash of the hash of the hash and, and do this, anyone can do this, it's extremely fast. Um, hash is a fast operation. Um, and but then coming backward is very difficult. Um, and so, so we said that naive RSA has to be signed on the hash values. Um, and so just to disrupt the, the pattern. And, um, and so that you will have um, you, the multiplicative property still is stays, but then you will, you will just get a whole bunch of hash. And, and because of the, the irreversibility of hash value, you can create a signature of some new hash, but then this new hash does not correspond to any meaningful messages, or if you don't even know what is the pre-image of this hash, so you cannot really make good use of it. So, so you know, you're gonna go through some of these exercises in your written homework assignment. Um, none of this is difficult. Make sure you just watch a, a video um, lecture and also read the reference materials that I mentioned in the, in the lecture. Um, so this is Professor Xiaoyun Wang. She is just a legendary figure in cryptography. She, uh, rumor has it that she worked on her own by, by herself for 10 years before breaking MD5 in 2004. Um, and the next year she broke SHA-1. Um, and, and she was in Shandong University, um, a, a mathematical, uh, a mathematics department professor. And, and so, so a lot of the, she was just figuring out the patterns in the, uh, cryptographic hash function, everyone else in the world was thinking that this is secure, secure collision resistance. And like when we were in grad school, we were all taught MD5, SHA-1 are secure collision resistant. Um, and so um, rumor has it that she was, she was um, presented two examples in her submission to a conference um, and then the, the, the paper is describing her breaking the MD5. And then of course the reviewers didn't believe her and, and they were like, okay, how come we didn't know this and maybe we should try those two 
messages, so, you know, which she said will produce the same hash value. And then they couldn't do, they, they couldn't um, confirm it. They couldn't validate it. The, the two messages produce different hash values. Um, and so the paper got rejected and, and, and turns out that um, because China and the U.S., the computer architecture has different way of encoding integers. And there's this big EDN and then small EDN, uh, little EDN. And, and so it's just a way that they encode the integers to the, the, the least significant bit is the most significant bit um, in another country. And, and so, but then once they figure that out and the paper got, uh, got accepted and, and, and people start to realize, oh, this is in, you know, indeed true. Um, why do hash collisions bad, right? So normally we use hash for a lot of things, right? So um, we, we, if we have to create a digital certificate, a public key certificate, right? So we compute the hash and then we compute uh, the CA will sign on the hash. And then this is all based on the assumption that the hash values will not collide and then you're assigning on the hash basically essentially you're assuming that um this statement there's no alternative form of this statement that will produce the same hash value um and so the, the hash value is tightly um combined you know correlated with the integrity of the message um, if you find collision, then it's no longer the, the case, right? The hash value may be colliding with another message. And so if you thought you were downloading a software, the hash matches, but then it could be a different, different software that you're downloading, downloading and then could be a different public key certificate. Um, and so how exactly how often are hash collisions? Um, how frequent would you find collisions? Um, and it turns out, and a lot of people that the way to estimate it is, is you, you estimate how many messages uh, will you see before, will you have to see before you, you obtain a collision with uh, greater than 0.5 probability. Right? So greater than 0.5 probability is, is really arbitrary. Um, but it's pretty high probability, right? So you know, if you if you if you have greater than 0.5 probability, you do this again and again. Eventually, you will get a collision. Um, so this is a very fascinating problem, and we're going to spend a little time explaining uh, this. Uh, a similar concept is called the birthday paradox, pigeonhole problem. Uh, coupon collectors pro problem. And so a lot of these problems uh, has a flavor of you map a big universe, items in the big universe. Think of hash is you have arbitrary messages of infinite long, okay? So you just, of all kinds of messages, you hash them into MD5, into SHA-1 that are like 100, 60 bit long, 128 bit long. So it's very small universe. If it's 128 bit long, that message, the hash, that only means how, how many variations you may have. Two to the power of 128 variations. In the whole world, there's just that many of hash values. Not a, not a whole lot. Um, so, you know, Collision is bound to happen, but then question is how fast it will happen. And in reality, people find that that collision happens a lot sooner than you thought. And so um, I find this a fun site at the bottom, putting.co. Um, you can learn a little bit about birthday paradox, um, um, how it is, uh, um, why did what's going on here? And then, so the problem is that it, the, the statement is the first day, first day problem is that how many people would you see, would you have to see in order for you to find two people who share the same birthday with greater than half probability? And so, how many, you know, there are 365 days uh, in, in a year, most of the time. And so, you would think 
in order to have collisions, you may have like 180 people. And so it's a pretty big number. Um, and and, and, and uh, the assumption here is you ignore year, okay, just a month and day. And also you assume people are equally likely to be born on a given day, uh, on a given day of a year. And so, so it turns out that the, the, um, it only takes 23 um, people uh, on average in order for you to find a birth state collision with probability greater than 0.5. Um, and so, so it's, it's a, lot, a lot smaller than the number of uh, days in the year. Um, and so, so it's called the birthday paradox because it's, it seems so small, um, so easy to find a collision. Um, and, and the rule of thumb to estimate the collisions is to have just, uh, uh, if you have the smaller universe, the, the entire universe is n. Um, say MD5, the length is 128 bit long, um, then the, the entire universe is 2 to the power of 128 bit. The way to estimate collision with the probability of 0.5 and above is to just to take square root of n. Um, square root of n in this case is 2 to the 64, which is not, not very big. Um, and so sharp, sharp 1 slightly better, uh, but again, so you one broke it in 2005. Shard 2 is still being used. Fine to, it's okay to use. It's, it's a, a lot longer. Shard 1 is, was released by NIST in 2015. The hash value is arbitrary length. It uh, varies. Uh, there's the more complicated operations. And, and so it's, a, it's much, much more resistant to collision. Um, resistance. I want you to all think about how would you estimate the birthday uh, paradox collision probabilities. Uh, we'll, we'll remember to do some exercise uh, next class, at the beginning of the next class. But, but you know, remember to visit that um, uh, website, the um, putin.cool website. Uh, Lampert one-time password. This is something that I want to uh, discuss uh, in a little bit depth. It's just a very interesting way of using hash function, cryptographic hash functions. Um, invented by Lampert back in the 1981. Uh, it, it was actually used in RSA Secure ID. It's a token that you carry um, and for multi-factor authentication nowadays, uh, you know, I doubt everyone, anyone use it. We all use um, cell phone right, to serve as a, uh, another factor. Before that, the, um, you, you, you can carry some companies, uh, or I say sell this secure token. You carry this, uh, it has this window, it shows the numbers and they keep rolling. Um, they keep rolling and then the server side also had this same secrets keep rolling and keep, you know, gets updated every few hours. And then when you log in, you enter your password as before. And then you also, you take out the secure token and read the secret number at that time and then enter it into, into your computer. And then for some magic reason, the server also had the same synchronized the secrets, they were able to do it. Um, so, so how does this work? This one-time password, the secrets never repeat. And the server, but then, but then you are able to synchronize it with the server. How does it work? And so let's, let's uh, see. I, I want you to think along with um, us. Um, the prem what's the premise? The premise is that at the beginning of time, the server and the client has some shared secret. And then they want to generate more secret, maybe one password per day. Um, and it's very important to, to, to have some sort of toler you know, fault tolerance mechanism. Maybe the client is offline for some period. Um, maybe go to, you know, some remote island, you know, it has no connection or got sick. Um, but then when the client come back, uh, we'll still be able to authenticate using this one new password a day. Okay, so, so that's a very interesting requirement. 
Um, and then the threat model, of course, is attacker will intercept traffic, attempt to impersonate, and it's very important that even if a password, today's password is compromised, um, or yesterday's password was compromised, future passwords are still fine, are still secure. Okay, so there is this timing elements here. Okay, so this is a very, very interesting setup. Can you think of a solution using hash function um, to do it? So, so let's just do a few attempts. And the first attempt, of course, very naive, but very straightforward um, is, okay, so, so we begin with some shared secret S. Maybe during the day one, um, day zero, they went after they use uh, S to authenticate, they agree upon a new secret, S1. And then S1 will be used to authenticate in day two. And then once, you know, day two communication is established that they um, agree upon a new secret, another secret S2 for day two and so on, so forth, right? So you get the white. Um, will this work? Will this, this very straightforward solution um, satisfy all the requirements? So let's recall what are our requirements. Communicate for a thousand consecutive days, uh, one, pass, one new password per day. Um, yeah, it, it will work if, if the user, you know, continue to communicate. Um, Let's see, so this work, the client may be offline for some unpredictable time, but still communicate, still be able to communicate after it's back online. Well, so this is, this is tricky. No, this attempt one will not satisfy this requirement because if you stop one day, then you, lo you, you lose track of what secret you are on. And then when you're back online, you are already falling behind because at day I, I stay, you, you are supposed to use SI. Because the server will, will be using, you know, uh, will, will be evolving and, you know, not waiting for you, but then you, know, you are off. There's a gap period that is very hard to catch up. Um, and so, so, so the, so that's, that's bad. The second requirement is not good. In terms of intercepting messages, um, attackers still won't be able to, in, in for future passwords, this is good, right? Because the, the secrets are, are all independent of each other. If you compromise S1, you still don't know what S2 is. They're all randomly chosen. Uh, but only that the second requirement is not satisfied. Um, so let's, let's see uh, uh, another attempt. And we said that we have to use some sort of a hash, right? So that's a hint. So, okay, how about we, um, at day one, we compute the hash of secret and use that as a passcode, the password. And then the on server, server does the same thing, right? Because server has S, can compute the hash. And then, you know, the, the, the client submit the hash of, um, uh, secret, um, then, you know, it's a match. And then we assume that it submits through a secret channel. If you don't have secret channel, establish a secret channel somehow, okay? Um, day two, you compute hash of hash, right? You can, you can always compute the hash of something, you, know, you can do this uh, forever. You can do it for 99 days, and then the last day you compute the hash for a thousand times, okay? And then you don't have to um, store the previous hashes. You, you just, uh, you, you keep S and every day you just uh, compute the hash a number of times because hash is fast. Then you don't have to, um, you, don't, you, you, you can always compute a fresh uh, password for that day. And the server does the same thing. So does attempt to satisfy all the requirements? So these are three requirements. Let's see, they uh, first communicate a thousand consecutive days, one new password per day, check. Client may be offline, 
but then still communicate after it's back. This is also check because you just remember the day, right? If it's a thousand day, then you just compute hash for a thousand times. So, so even if you are on a remote island, you got COVID, whenever you get up, as long as you have a calendar, you look up the calendar, see today is 865 day. Um, therefore, I have to compute hash this number of times. Hmm, how about intercepting messages won't enable attackers to learn future passwords? Okay, so this doesn't uh, look like, it doesn't look like attempt to uh, secure in that regard, right? Because anyone can compute hash values. If attacker intercepts day two's message and, and day two's password is compromised, attacker can compute um, passwords for all the future days, all future days, right? So, so that, that's not good. This is not secure. This is a very uh, important, this, the very important secure, security requirement is not satisfied. How can you fix this? Can you think for uh, 10 seconds? Let's think for 10 seconds. Very, very close. We are very, very close. Any idea? So just to use a hash in reverse, right? Because the hash is one way. So if you compute the hash value a thousand times on day one and use that as a password and the server does the same thing, it's a match, you can communicate the day two you have as you compute 999 times of hash, right? So you just go backward. In that case, if someone uh, obtain, say, um, day 998 password, um, they cannot do anything because they will not be able to reverse it um, for the next day. The next day you need to have um, hash of the hash of s, right? So you still don't know because you have hash of the hash of the hash, right? So because of the one wayness, you cannot obtain future passcode. And so this is exactly how Lampert solved it. It's called a one time pass password. Um, again, used in a lot of a lot of the, the applications where you have to have synchronized the communications, synchronize the secrets. And then uh, you have, you know, have certain tolerance um, uh, against the disruptions. So very, very simple, very interesting um, scheme. All right, next I want to say a little bit about the key to hash. Key to hash also because the longer name is the hash the based message authentication code, HMAC. So it's, it's, it's called key to hash, it's a, it's a hash with a key concatenated with it. And you can think of this as a symmetric key signature scheme. Um, in comparison, RSA is a public key signature scheme. The, um, and you don't require to, uh, to share a secret between signer and a verifier. Here with the key to hash on the left hand side, the signer and the verifier need to have a shared key. Um, and so it's extremely simple. You just have the message and then the key and then concatenate them and maybe some padding and so on. And then you compute the hash. And so it's key the hash. In order to uh, verify uh, the, the message is um, preserved, it's preserved, it's not tampered with, the receiver end will use the same key and then the receive the message, concatenate them and then compute the hash and see whether they match. So, so this is very, very simple. Of course, it's not very scalable because uh, require this to share the key. Um, but simple and efficient, extremely fast to compute. Um, and so as we are wrapping up with this uh, pub 
the, the public key crypto system, you may wonder, besides RSA, uh, are there other public key crypto system? We talked about DeFi Hellman, um, but then um, in relatively recent crypto history, there is an invention which is very, very important called identity-based encryption, IBE. Um, the concept is that, is it possible to use your email address as a public key or your name? or your name plus your email address plus your affiliation. So basically use the arbitrary strings, the meaningful strings. And the problem with RSA is that the public keys all look random. That's why we have to have public key certificate, public key infrastructure to bind the key with the person, with bind the key with a company. Otherwise, you, if you don't just look at the key, um, it doesn't say Amazon, Google, um, like Barnes and Noble. And so you have to have this infrastructure. What if you have like Amazon.com as your public key? Then in that case, there's no need to do certificate. There's um, anyone else, unless they corrupt, um, um, they, uh, unless they somehow hijack the domain, they won't be able to uh, impersonate Amazon because all the traffic will go to Amazon.com instead of you know to to attackers website even if um, in um, so so you you won't be able to um, you you don't need a certificate um, and and you don't have any, you can just simply look up the, the email address, domain name, and so on. So, so this was a vision that people um, described back in the 80s. Um, and and no, one, no one knows how to, how to uh, achieve this until um, researchers uh, find out how to provide a specific scheme um, back in 2001. What, 19, 19 years ago. When I was in grad school, this was extremely popular. I also did some work on identity-based encryption. Um, and so, so read about it if you're interested. I will not go into details. Um, and it's not very widely deployed. And NIST had workshops and, um, and, and about, about the IBE and then the de deployment standards and, and so on. So, so I know some uh, enterprises, companies in the smaller uh, organizations, um, they, do, they do have IBE deployed, not on the internet, not um, uh, in that scale. Uh, before we end, I want to say a little bit about uh, um, checksum and CRC, cyclic and redundancy check. And those are for message integrity, usually uh, for ensuring there's no transmission errors or detecting transmission errors. Transmission errors where bits are flipped when you, when they, you know, go across wires. Um, and it's extremely fast that there is no key, there's no secrets, uh, very fast. Um, and, and sometimes you download um, software, there's also checksum. Uh, you can also use a cryptographic hash uh, as a checksum. Uh, in that for network, um, CRC, CRC uh, and the checksum are usually used. Um, some are for different layers. And here are the five layer network stack. We mentioned this before. Um, it's very important you memorize this, okay? The five layers, uh, what are they for? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more, we'll talk a, a lot more about network security, but, but you know, um, we will, we will not go into details about the, the layers, but it's important to have some concrete and some intuition about the, the layers. Uh, this is a AO2.11 frame uh, for local area network, you know, think of Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi network, you and your access point, you and your modem, the communication are in this kind of frames, these frames. Uh, also, you know, back in the old days, and, and we still have it, uh, you know, the, the ethernet, which is wired the local area networks, also similar frames. Um, if you look at the end, in, in the beginning, there is some like index, address, sender, receiver, the, the access points. 
um, and payload. Uh, but then if you look at the end, there is a CRC, which is, which is the uh, computed as a, a remainder in the binary division operation. Um, and so, so it's just to allow you to quickly making sure that um, if, if certain bits are flipped, you may be able to detect it. You don't, you don't always detect it, but you may be able to detect it. And most of the time you detect it. Um, uh, another is at a different layer. This is UDP at the transport layer. Uh, there's a checksum, um, not, not in the CRC, but, the, but this is uh, in the addition form. It's, it's checksum addition of one's complements. And, and here are some examples of what one's complements is. Sometimes you can use two's complements. Um, and, and so it's very important to know this is if, if um, there's no bits flipping, then checksum will pass. If there are bits flipping, that most of the time you may be able to detect it. Um, I find that this very interesting uh, experiment results from a, um, a dissertation that compare the arrow error rate, undetected error rate. So if you look at the y-axis, there's a percentage of undetected errors. Um, of course, the lower the better. And then the y are the code word lens, um, the, the payload lens. You can think of this as a payload lens. And then different line representing different uh, types of uh, checksum. Uh, some use one's complement, two's complement, X or, um, and then with different lens. Okay, and so so essentially it shows that different uh, checksum have different security guarantee, different uh, accuracy guarantee. Longer checksum bits, fewer, more bits so will be able to incorporate more information, more digest information, allow you to lower the undetected error rate. Um, and it's very important to know that this type of checksum is for um, unintentional, largely for unintentional uh, um, transmission errors, unintentional, um, non-malicious transmission errors. Um, be because you may, if it's, you cannot completely rely on this for message integrity because uh, attacker may be able to find a different message that to produce uh, a passing, a, a satisfiable um, checksum, a different message that, um, that, uh, that, that you won't detect um, because, because there are error rates. And so, so it's for unintentional like transmission error, benign kind of uh, errors. Um, so, so here, so, so I want to just uh, stop here and, and uh, um, a little bit of a summary. We talked about symmetric encryption, a different way of doing the, the symmetric encryption permutation substitution. Um, then we um, explain why it's extremely important uh, to have public key crypto system so that we can communicate to entities that we don't know. Um, and, and then we talked about the key exchange protocol, the issues, the RSA, uh, how does it work, why does it work, why it, it works, um, some of the issues, uh, use it for digital signature scheme, cryptographic hash, um, and then you know, just different fancy ways of using hash. Um, and it's very important to remember public key crypto system is very slow. So, so don't, don't propose something saying that, oh, I want to um, um, communicate like a YouTube video, encrypt it, encrypt it with a RSA key. No, it's, it's not gonna be fast. It's gonna be extremely slow, especially if you do streaming videos um, very, very time sensitive. Um, symmetric encryption is fast. Um, um, so a lot of times that the, the content is, once the, the initial class, uh, the, the key is established, then you, then you start to communicate using secret key uh, crypto system like AES. Um, 
hashing extremely fast. And, and so have, knowing that the having some intuition about the operation, the performance is very important. Um, that, that will uh, help you understand why certain protocols is structured that way. Because if you think um, from a security point of view alone, then everyone would just do RSA all the time. But then, but then in reality, it's, it's not practical because there's very important performance uh, requirement as well. Um, so, um, I, uh, by the way, I have already uh, gave you feedbacks on your class projects. Um, I really enjoyed the reading all, all of the proposals and, and, and very much look forward to hearing more of it. Um, and uh, next class, we want to say a little bit of, of, about web security and then there will be a cross-site scripting as programming assignment coming out um, later this week. Um, you will certainly get get notified, and so so very very exciting, very very fun exercise, um, and hope hope you, hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, this is the end of the the crypto discussion. We'll begin talking about network security, web security, um, for the for the second half of the semester, um, and so make sure you continue doing your projects. It's, it's ongoing. Uh, we'll have, you will have an opportunity to send an, another update um, in, in the, in before, before the, the final presentation. The final presentation, you will um, do a short video like you did before, um, and then also a short write-up. All right, I think that's it for today. We'll stop right here. Thank you so much. Have a good day.